Good morning, UCB, and welcome to Palm Sunday. As I was preparing my message today, it began with a choice. Now, for those who are unfamiliar with how the lectionary works, passages from the Bible are divided up between Sundays in a four-year cycle. So, obviously, for non-ordinary times of the liturgical year, these passages reflect the seasons, whether they be Christmas, Lent, Easter, and so on. For today, I was faced with two options. I could follow the Liturgy of the Palms or the Liturgy of the Passion. Did I want to focus on the celebratory nature of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem or the more somber fact that this entry marked the beginning of Holy Week, the beginning of his suffering? Mm, decisions, decisions. Now, they say that any minister only really has one sermon and that all sermons they write are merely a different facet of their own gem of what's known as the diamond sermon. <laughs> this is certainly true for me. It becomes acutely apparent this time of year when the kingdom of God is compared and contrasted over and over again. Needless to say, I could not decide between palms and passion since both are a part of establishing that kingdom more and more firmly here on earth. Both passages are elaborately intertwined in my one sermon. And this is one of the reasons Palm Sunday is one of my favorite sermons to volunteer for. Another reason is it's an easy sermon to write since I literally have one sermon for today. You see, back in 2007 or 2008, I was introduced to The Last Week by Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crossan as our study book for adult education at Redlands United Church of Christ. I relished the chance to read this book as I was already familiar with both Borg and Crossan's work through college classes. Since then, I've preached the same Palm Sunday sermon with slightly different wording and different quotes taken from the book. Easy. And I'm in good company as well. Just here at UCV, you've heard this sermon from myself, from Sharon, and after studying this book in our own adult ed a couple of years ago, from Darcy. In other words, I think you all have heard it enough. And so I ask you to buckle up because this year I'm going off script, slightly. So just as a brief refresher to set the stage, let me read to you Borg and Crossan's take on what was happening. I'm reading from the last week. Two processions entered Jerusalem on a spring day in the year 30. One was a peasant procession, the other an imperial procession. From the east, Jesus rode a donkey down the Mount of Olives, cheered by his followers. Jesus was from the peasant village of Nazareth. His message was about the kingdom of God, and his followers came from the peasant class. They had journeyed to Jerusalem from Galilee, about a hundred miles to the north, a journey that is the central section and the central dynamic of Mark's gospel. Mark's story of Jesus and the kingdom of God has been aiming for Jerusalem, pointing to Jerusalem. It is now arrived. On the opposite side of the city from the west, Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of Idumea, Judea, and Samaria, entered Jerusalem at the head of a column of imperial cavalry and soldiers. Jesus's procession proclaimed the kingdom of God. Pilate's proclaimed the power of empire. The two processions embody the central conflict of the week that led to Jesus's crucifixion. 
so here we have these two processions that are diametrically opposed to each other. The one led by Jesus, actually a counter protest to all that was wrong in the world at the time. It was planned. Jesus had sought out ahead of time a young donkey, one that was old enough to hold a rider, but who had never been ridden before. This colt representing something new, ushering in God's kingdom of peace and equality. Jesus had planned what gate into the city they would enter. Some say a gate in one section of the east wall of the temple grounds. In Jewish belief, this gate is called the gate of mercy. And in Jewish tradition, this is the gate that the Shekinah or divine presence would appear through. This tells us something, I believe, about what a just peace protest looks like. It's a planned event or action. We consider the details. Why? Because the work of standing up to oppression and injustice is important and worthy of our consideration. Now, other parts were not choreographed ahead of time as they came spontaneously from those following Jesus with the crowd that had joined along the way. Remember, these were peasant people many of them having traveled great distances to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. They had little more with them than the clothing they would need for the journey. These peasant folk and disciples used what they had with them and what they could, they could find en route. Their cloaks, branches, sticks, palm fronds, for they did not travel with colorful banners to erect. They use their voices to shout, save us, Hosanna, for there were no trumpeters in their ranks. They used the tools they had. Now, later in Mark's account, it was a couple of days before Passover, and we read of Jesus eating dinner as a guest of Simon the leper, when a woman infuriates some of the attendees by pouring expensive perfume over Jesus' head. It was thought it better to have sold the perfume and given it to the poor. What a waste. And Jesus is quick to stand up for her as she was using what she had when she saw need. He also used this as a teaching moment for all those who disagreed to remind them that the poor are with them every day and that whenever they feel like it, they can do something for them. Handing out charity is only one of many ways to help those in need. Needs come in different forms. Now, today, we began by staging our own procession, waving and laying down some of the items that were the tools of our trades, the things that we might, on any given day, be able to quickly pick up and use in the work of standing up to the oppressive regimes of our day. Some of you may have wondered about the music I chose as the soundtrack to our procession. Fanfare for the Common Man is not a typical Palm Sunday tune, and yet it seemed most fitting. According to NPR, in 1942, Aaron Copland was commissioned by the music director of the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra to write a fanfare. You see, the U.S. had entered World War II and then Vice President Henry Wallace was trying to rally Americans against imperialism. Copeland was inspired by a speech Wallace gave that spring at the Free World Association in New York City. Some have spoken of the American century Wallace proclaimed. I say the century which we are entering, the century on which will come out of this war, can be and must be the century of the common man. Copeland would later echo that sentiment himself, saying, it was the common man, after all, who was doing all the dirty work of the war and the army. He deserved a fanfare. Public Radio listener Lynn Gilbert spoke with NPR and said, In spite of the current political landscape, 
I guess I still believe that there is an American dream of peace and prosperity for everyone. Music that soars and inspires like this piece does brings hope for the future. Now, I did not choose this piece for the exact reasons Copeland wrote it, but rather for a broader understanding that it is the common man that does all the dirty work in the work for justice. And that work began with the common man of Jesus. Like Lynn Gilbert, I also believe in a dream of peace and prosperity through equality for everyone. I don't believe, however, this is an American dream. I believe it is the gospel. Taken from the 15th General Synod, when the pronouncement on affirming the United Church of Christ as a just peace church was adopted, the final pronouncement reads, just peace is grounded in hope. Shalom is the vision that pulls all of creation toward a time when weapons are swept off the earth and all creatures lie down together without fear, where all have their own fig tree and dwell secure from want. As Christians, we offer this conviction to the world, peace is possible. Indeed, a fanfare for the common man, all common men, women, children, and humans. May we plan our protests and action campaigns. May we take up whatever is at our disposal and use them in, as tools of justice. May we continue to follow Jesus into and beyond Jerusalem. May we become aware that there really is no choice between Palm Sunday and the passion of Holy Week and its suffering, but rather a hope that will come as resurrection of a just peace after witnessing this suffering. Amen.